Good morning, class. Hi, I'm Keith Moore, and we welcome you to Faith School. Faith School's the place where my spirit is fed, where my faith grows stronger, and where I learn how to be an overcomer. You know, just because you're, you're born again, born of God, doesn't mean you automatically know everything. Uh, the scripture says, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. And he talks about not being conformed to this world, but being transformed by the renewing of your mind, which is why we say, learn how to be an overcomer. Uh, there's, there's so much to learn and to know, and the place to find out about it is the Bible. The Word of God, the inspired Word of God. So get your Bible, get something to make a note with, come into the classroom with us, and let's release faith and get answers today. Father, we worship you. You are our God, we are your people, and we worship you. Thank you for being so gracious, so good, so merciful, so kind, so faithful. We ask for direction and help and answers uh, exactly what you know we need right now. We purpose not to be forgetful hearers, hearers only, but by your grace to be doers, to uh, show us how to implement it, how to practice it. And we know that as surely as we do that, you'll watch over your word and perform it in our lives and we will have miracles, amazing things happen. To your glory, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Look please again in Scripture in 1 John 5 that we've been looking at for some weeks now in a series that we're calling Faith That Overcomes. In uh, 1 John 5 and 4, it says, For whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world even our faith. Are you born of God? Well, if you're, if you're not, you need to get that way. You need to receive Him right away. And Romans 10 tells us how to do that. Go ahead and turn to Romans 10. What's the thing about being born of God? Makes you an overcomer. Romans 10 Verse 9 and 10, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart that God's raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Uh, it's not complicated, but it must be genuine. It's not just parroting something that somebody else said. It's actually believing something in your heart and expressing that faith with the words of your mouth. Let's do it right now. Let's affirm or reaffirm your faith in the Lord. Say it out loud, I believe in God. I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. I believe in Jesus. That he came to earth. He came to earth. Hung on the cross. Hung on the cross. Paid, the paid the price for all my sins. All my sins. And, I believe and I believe he's been raised from the dead. He's been raised from the dead. Jesus, Jesus, I confess you. As Lord of my life, thank you for saving me. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. That involves receiving him, involves receiving everything he has done for you, which takes the volume of the book to describe. And so when you do that from the heart, you are forever changed. Old things pass away. And everything inside you has become new. You are a new creation in Christ Jesus. You're born of God, a world overcomer. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Woo, it's wonderful. 
Well, he goes on to talk about this. He says, uh, verse 15, how beautiful are the feet of them that proclaim the good news, the gospel of peace, and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So here the gospel is referred to as the report. And verse 17 in Young's literal says it that way. So faith comes by a report and the report by the saying of God, what God has said. And so we looked in Numbers 13. Go ahead and go back there again if you would. Numbers 13 and 14 that talk about uh, a report, a good report, a bad report, and a choice as to which one you believe and in the outcome of that. What we've been studying and seeing is that God gave them the good report, which is the, uh, a type of the gospel. And the good news was, I've uh, selected for you a land. And this land is not just property, not just geography, it's a lifestyle. It is freedom. It is prosperity. It is God intended for them to enjoy it. And that's something that uh, people that have become religious and, and that don't know God have omitted. And all they talk about is sacrifice. And all they talk about is uh, judgment and that kind of thing. And to hear them talk, the Lord doesn't want you to enjoy anything. That if you're enjoying something, you're probably doing something wrong. It's probably something that you need to give up or, or quit. But that simply is not true. The scripture says in Timothy that God gives us richly all things to enjoy. He is the God of blessing. And blessing is power. It's the power to get, it's the power to enjoy, and it's the power to give. And that's how good God is. So many people, they just don't believe how good God is. They just don't. They will say it, and then they'll turn around and say, oh, well, that's too much. Well, no, they couldn't believe that God would want you to have that or, or use that, be able to do that. Uh, they, they really don't believe how good he is. But when you feed on the word, instead of religious ideas and traditional ideas, you see a good God. Amen. Abraham knew a good God. Amen. Is that right? Yes. I mean, a God who made him rich. Is that right? Yes. A God who delivered him, protected him, healed him and his. I mean, you'd have a hard time convincing Abraham that God wanted him broke or sick or defeated. And Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, David, Solomon, the list goes on. They knew a good God. Has he changed? When did he change? He hasn't changed. He never changes. But God gave them the good report. What's the good report? I have the land for you that I have picked out myself. A while back, we went through the scriptures in Deuteronomy and other places and, and, and read what he said. I have selected for you a good land. And in fact, uh, the word is not just good. It has a de descriptor. Uh, in some, some places, it could be translated exceeding, exceeding good. <laughs> and some modern translations will just simply say very good. A few will say very, very good. Is God good? Yes. Is God very good? Yes. Is God exceeding, exceeding good? Yes. yes. The New Testament, Ephesians tells us, that he is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we have asked or thought. I mean, as much as you can stretch yourself to think, God can outshine that. <laughs> Hallelujah. When you think you have just gone over the top, 
God says, okay, I'll take it from there. <laughs> How many believe God really is this big, this great, this grand, this good? Most people don't. Most people do not. They somehow or another, I say somehow or another, through religious teaching and ideas, they've come to believe God is old and stuffy and grumpy and just no fun. Lies. I said lies. Lies. If you want to see God, look at Jesus. He is the expression of the Father. He said, if you've seen me, You've seen the Father. And you know, little kids loved Jesus. Amen. Well, little kids, they'd mob him. Don't you remember? There were times the disciples were peeling kids off of Jesus and telling people, come get your kids. They're trying to get them away. And Jesus said, leave them alone. Let them come. He said, heaven is like this. Of such is the kingdom of heaven. Uh, and so, uh, and that's another thought. You know, God doesn't lose his kids, his children. Out of all the tragedies and all the cruelty and stuff that happens down here on the earth, those kids are not lost forever. God has those kids. Hallelujah. 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 He's, he's got them. He's got them all. And that's why we're going to see a bunch of them. Of such is the kingdom of heaven. But uh, uh, little kids, they don't like uh, grumpy, uh, right? <laughs> Mean, hard people, that scares them, right? Little ones, they don't, oh, they, they'll, they'll hide behind mama's leg, you know, you know, they don't, oh, meanie. No, but Jesus, it, the Bible said he had the oil of gladness above his contemporaries. He, Jesus was fun to be around. You believe that or not? Jesus was and is the life of the party. Fun to be around. Now see, that, that just doesn't even sound right to religious-minded folk. They're like, no, they got to, you know, they, they've looked at this picture that somebody painted that looks nothing like Jesus. <laughs> and this scowl, it was on the face of this portrait. No, Jesus is not how some mixed up person imagined him to be. He is who he is. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. And will always be. And he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that same is good. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. He's good. He's love. He's life. He's peace. He's joy. Can you say amen? amen. And God's always been this. And so when he delivered his people out of Egyptian bondage, they have known such hardship. They've never owned their own property. They haven't owned the rags on their back. And now they're all healed. They're all free. They've got money. And God says, I got the spot for you. I've picked it out for you. And it is beautiful. You don't have to work hard and irrigate it like you did over there uh, in that dry spot. Some of that place y'all are working. I rain on it. I watch over it. I send the early rains, the latter rains. It's a land of flows with milk and honey, a good land. Why am I saying that? That's the good report about the good things that their good God has already prepared, already determined, predetermined, foreordained, picked out, selected, and given to them. And so the 12 spies go up to see, and they come back, and they say, yeah, it is a beautiful place. Yeah, look at the grapes. <laughs> yeah, it's a place of abundance. It flows with milk and honey. But none of that matters. Nevertheless, why? It's occupied. It's like people are there. And not just people, big people, giants, cities with walls and gates you can't even get in. And we saw the sons of Anak 
Now that was of the descendants of the giant. And there were giants in those days. Uh, we're told Og, who was a giant, that's a good giant name, isn't it? Og. <laughs> Og, he was, the, he was a king of Bashan. His bed, his custom made bed, was 13 feet long and six feet wide. Well, you know, uh, somebody the size of uh, Shaquille O'Neal, he's like seven foot tall and, and weighed as much as, you know, 350 pounds plus. Well, this is somebody that's another three feet taller <laughs> than Shaq and weighs 750. <laughs> and you're going to go hand to hand combat with these people? You can see why it seemed so daunting, so overwhelming to, to them. But the problem is they are forgetting God. They saw the giants and they got giants on the brain and they became fixated on the giants and forgot about God. Oh class, are y'all awake? Yes. This has happened over and over and over and over and over again. It's how you wind up getting defeated instead of being victorious. It's what you look at. It's what you focus on. Is God surprised about the giants in the walled cities over there? No. He knew they were there when he told them to go there. He knew they were there when he told them, I've given it to you. So does God see it as a problem? No. <laughs> to him, it's no problem at all. Why? Because he's not comparing the giants to them. He's comparing the giants to him. Huh? And you want to talk about big? <laughs> God is big. You want to talk about strong? God is strong. A ten foot guy? That don't mean anything to God. A forty foot man wouldn't mean anything to God. Is that right? God makes mountains. God makes stars. God makes planets. So what does he care about Og? Or Goliath. But you only have that perspective when you're seeing it from God's viewpoint. Right? Yes. And when you're seeing it from His viewpoint, the fear leaves you and peace comes in and strength. But when you are not even thinking about God, when you forget about God, what he said, what he's done, who he is, what he can do. When you quit talking about him, you forget about him, and you're just looking at the giant, and you, and the giant, and you, and the giant. Fear. Can you see this? Fear comes in. Hopelessness comes on you. And that's, can, can you see this happening? See, we talked about this earlier in the study about the spirit of fear and the spirit of faith. Uh, keep reading here in uh, chapter 13. They, they said, we, uh, we saw these giants there. And verse 30, Caleb still the people before Moses. And he said, let us go up at once and possess it, for we're well able to overcome it. What, what's he talking about? We're well able. What's the next phrase say? The men that went up with him, they said, we be not able to go up against the people. They're stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report against the land. What's the evil report? The evil report is, no, it's not our land. It's their land. No, it's not a land you'll enjoy. It's a land that will, where you will die. It's a land that will destroy you. It's not the good land. It's the giant's land. Evil report. Bad report. Why? It contradicts what God said. God said, it's your land. I've given it to you. It's a good land. 
where you will enjoy. You'll enjoy houses you didn't build, vineyards you didn't plant. Good report? Bad report. Come on, can you see this? And, and did God pick for them? Did he make them choose the right report? Did he make them believe his report? No, you'll always have a free will. And if you want to fear, you can. If you want to forget God, you can. One will be a fool if they do. But why would Caleb say, let's go get it. Let's go up now. We are well able. See, what are we talking about? He is not comparing himself against the giants. He's not infatuated with them and how big they are. He is focused on God and how big he is. Oh, well, friend, don't let this be too simple for you. This is how you fight the good fight of faith. This is how you overcome all the problems that are in the world because you will, before your life is over, you will come face to face with Og and his kin. What do you mean? Og's the giant. And, and Og was a real giant. And Goliath, a real 10 foot tall killing machine. That in your own strength and power, you can't take him. There's no way by yourself. But thank God, you're not by yourself. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. You didn't come by yourself. Amen. You know, in our graphic that's, that's on faith school, that's David and Goliath. And uh, how can he go head to head? Huh? How can he arm wrestle <laughs> this guy? <laughs> he, he can't. But in, if you go back to 1 Samuel 17 and you read that account, David, through that whole thing, he never called Goliath a giant. Never called him a giant. Never talked about how big he was or how bad he was. And he, he didn't talk about how amazing he was as a warrior. He, he's a teenager probably. I mean, he didn't have a bunch of experience except... With a lion <laughs> and a bear, they're big too. But what's he talking about? He said, you come to me with, with a sword, a shield, a spear, and these things were mammoth. We, we were given uh, what they weighed. His coat of mail weighed about 125 pounds. I mean, <laughs> you put all this on top of a six, 700 pound guy, I mean... <laughs> The bulk is massive. <laughs> and, and yet, David says, you come to me, I'm going to paraphrase a little bit, with all your mass and all your, you know, soldier experience and all that. I'm coming to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, whom you have defied. You've been out here cussing God, and you don't know who you've been cussing, big boy. You, <laughs> you're in trouble. But see, what's he doing? Is he comparing himself to the giant? That's how you get terrified. And see, may, maybe you're not dealing with a literal physical giant, but maybe it's a diagnosis of terminal cancer. Maybe it's a diagnosis of some kind of mental uh, issue, Alzheimer's, or, or maybe it's a, something in your relationship or something that you just... You know, you look at it and it looks like it's 10 foot tall. It looks like it's 20 foot tall. And compared to what you know and what you can do, you just feel helpless. You feel overwhelmed. You feel overcome. And if all you do is look at it and talk about how bad it is and how big it is, you will be filled with fear. And you will conclude, I can't. I just can't. I can't deal with this anymore. I can't handle this. I just can't. There's no way. There's no way. It'll build up in you until even though you know you shouldn't say it, it'll come out of your mouth because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. But there's another way. I said there's another way. Instead of looking at the problem, talking about how tall the giant is, how big he is, how strong he is, how much he weighs, how many people he's killed... Quit talking about the giant. 
Talk about your God. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. hallelujah. How big he is. Yes. You want to talk about big? God is big. Woo! Look across the mountain ranges. Look across the Pacific Ocean. Look into the night sky. God is big. What's a giant compared to God? Nothing. Nothing. That's why Caleb says, let's go get it. Let's go do it. Why? If you read the next, next chapter, they said, God's with us. They, they don't even have any protection. Their defense has departed from them. They'll be bred for us. Well, see, that's the opposite. It's actually a play on the words because these people had said, good land? No, nah. it's a land that will eat you up. They're saying it's an evil land. Why? They brought up an evil report against the land. And, and here, Caleb and Joshua are saying later in the 14th chapter, no, no, God's with us. They don't even have any protection. We will eat them up <laughs> like bread. They're a piece of bread. No, they're not going to eat us up. We will eat them up. Let's go do it. And it made the people so upset, they wanted to stone uh, Joshua and Caleb right there on the spot. It just vexed them. Why? They're so full of fear. Because they forgot God. They forgot what he has already done. They forgot who he is. They forgot what he said. And they're full of fear of men. Don't you remember the psalmist said, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. And then he starts enumerating them. He starts saying them. And the more you do that, the more you remind yourself then you're, you're, you're not talking about how big the problem is. You're talking about how big your God is. You're magnifying God and the fear will just leave you. And the strength and confidence will come up in you. Next thing you know, you'll be swinging in your hammock at Canaan's land. Hallelujah. <laughs> and our time's up again today. Say, I, I live by faith. I walk by faith. I overcome this world by faith. I am strong in faith. Say that one again. I am strong in faith. One more time. I am strong in faith, giving glory to God. Praise God. Come back tomorrow. There's a lot more to see. We'll see you soon here in Faith School. I've got the victory living inside. Thank you for joining us at Faith School. Class is dismissed for today, but you can watch this and other episodes of Faith School free of charge at faithschool.org. For more information, visit our website or call us at 941-702-7390.